This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and Southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. It's Dan and Matt back with you for another Fireside Chat, and uh, this is our, I guess, pre-postseason Fireside Chat. It's uh, the regular season's over, Matt, and for once, we've still got some hockey to talk about going into mid-April. Oh, it's nice. It's the third time since we've been doing the show that we get to cover the postseason, and hopefully, unlike the second time, uh, we can actually talk about more than one round and the first time that it feels like, you know what, we could be doing this until May or June. Cross your fingers. Yeah, and hopefully the Flames themselves don't take any game lightly. Like, Colorado is a very dangerous team, even though they're eighth place. Like, you have to be a good team to make the playoffs. When I was leaving the Edmonton game, I heard a guy on the train say to his friend, I don't think this series will be long. It'll only be six or seven games. Like, what's your thing? Is best of 11? That would keep us playing until, like, July. Well, hey, you know, we have to interfere with James Neal's off-season training even more. You'll interfere with everybody. If, you've, if you're still trying to get Flame fans to the Dome in July during Stampede Week... That'd be fun. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Where's yeah. all the countries... Where's Reba McIntyre going to play or ever country artists they're bringing in this year? You'd have to do like Reba on ice because they'll still have the ice on the dome. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, before we get to the postseason, let's uh, look back at the rest of the regular season. We had three games from last week. Um, you and I recorded last Monday during the LA game, and when we shut it down, we thought, ah, the Flames aren't going to win there. I think they were tied with LA 2-2, and boy, were we wrong. Uh, Jonathan Quick didn't look so quick in this one, and Calgary... Uh, got the second most points in franchise history at 107 with a big 7 to 2 win in LA. Yeah, uh, the Flames uh, they just took Jonathan Quick out to the shed and put him away. <laughs> you know, it that this is one of the games where like you just point to anytime anybody says uh the Flames should go after or any team should go after Jonathan Quick. Uh, he's not the same guy, unfortunately, and until he can get himself in order, like it, it he's he's done really as an NHL. I goal think they're going to try and move that deal in the off season, but then they're going to have to pay somebody to pick it up. Yeah, I agree, and it'll be tough for them to do so. And I think that the only way that I could see them doing that is if they can find another team with an equally dead contract and just swap the two bad contracts. Sort of like quick for Lucic or something like that. Like, just deadbeat contract And Evan didn't need a goalie. Yeah, deadbeat contract for deadbeat contract, and hopefully the player bounces back. And in seven goals in this game, all depth scoring, which is pretty amazing. Ryan got his 11th, Bennett got his 13th. We had one goal from Goudreau, his 36th of the year, and then Neil got his 7th, Ryan got his 12th, Mangiapane got his 8th, and Jankowski got his 13th. So six of the seven, all from the depth scorers. Yep. Which is what you want to see in that last week of the season. Oh, for sure. And especially in the playoffs, having the depth guys – contributing is key for any team to be successful i don't think there's much else to say in that one besides well the flames got the job done yep exactly uh, a couple days later calgary went to anaheim to play against the ducks in the dreaded honda center and couldn't get the job done goudreau got his 98th point of the season that's about all we can say in that one on a uh goal from Derek ryan his 13th of the year as the flames fell three to one to the anaheim ducks yeah, this was a boring game. Calgary it was like, like an exhibition game, and the roster pretty much reflected that too. Yeah, it's like don't get hurt, yay, and that was about it. Yeah, I mean, uh, you could tell guys like Sam Steele, Max Jones, some of their rookies playing, uh, you know, quite hard. But if you look at who was scratched for Calgary: Sam Bennett, T.J. Brody, Mark Giordano, Travis Hamonic, Noah Hannafin, Elias Lindholm, and Sean Monahan. Like, 
who who was not scratched for the Flames? It's basically let's get Gaudreau points and yeah, everybody else you can just have a nice time. Yeah, so kind of when I looked at the playing roster for this game, it's what I expected based on the playing roster. Yeah. Um, not much to say here. No. And same goes really for the Oilers game. Yeah, Calgary came home on Saturday to play the Battle of Alberta, the last one of the season, against the Oilers. Um, again, a not as much of a lopsided roster, but Sam Bennett, Oliver Shillington, Sean Monaghan, Alan Quine, Michael Stone, Matthew Kachuk, Yusuf Valimaki sat out as the Flames fell 3-1 to to Edmonton. This looked like game 83 from a team that didn't, or game 82, sorry, from a team that just didn't care. Yeah. And again, like every time Gaudreau was on the ice, it's like, hey, let's get him to 100. And that was basically like the defense didn't care. The forwards didn't care about playing defense. It was like, let's get Johnny a point. Calgary had no forecheck, no back check. It was pretty much when he went out there, put the little guy in front of the net and someone get him the puck. Yeah. And that was about it. it and he got point ninety nine, And I think if he would have got 100, nobody would have cared what the score was. Yeah, exactly. And... The thing that I'll be interesting, interested to see is tomorrow with the draft lottery. I'd find it hilarious if the New York Rangers ended up winning the draft lottery or one of the three top picks and the Oilers did not because the Oilers with that win leapfrogged the Rangers in the standings. And I'd find it amusing if the, for the second time in the last uh, 15 years, w them winning game 82 in a meaningless game could end up screwing their team out of a top player. We'll see, I guess. it's. Uh, I still think that, and I've said this to you for years, if I was the Oilers GM, which thankfully I'm not, I would trade that pick, get an NHL player for it. Oh, actually, I think that the teams come full circle where they just need to tear down and rebuild again and just like keep McDavid, Dreisaitl and Nugent Hopkins and maybe Darnell Nurse and then just like for sale signs on everything else and just get prospects coming up again and I did want to point out here good for former flame Alex Chase on who has 22 goals as an oiler this year yeah, well, playing with McDavid for a good portion of the year, that'll do that. And he got two points in this game. Um, he got a goal, and then he assisted on the nurse goal. But, yeah, this looked kind of how I thought the team would look. Like I said, no forecheck, no back check. And talking to the boys afterwards in the dressing room, nobody really cared. They were just looking ahead to the playoffs. Yeah, and that's how it should be. Like, it, You can't go up, you can't go down. You've already clinched second overall in the NHL, so you'll have home ice unless you're playing Tampa in the finals. So, does it matter? No. So, priority number one is just don't get hurt, and I'm glad to see that Connor McDavid was not injured on that play. I was going to say, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the McDavid incident. Um, what were your thoughts on that? So a lot of people on Twitter afterwards saying it was dirty. I talked to Giordano in the room, and we have some audio from him later. Um, he was very remorseful. It did, doesn't sound like he meant to do it at all. Well, that's a play that happens, like, virtually any time a defenseman's beat like that, they try to dive and sweep for the puck. 999 times out of 1,000, the guy just slides aimlessly into the boards, gets up, and skates to the bench. It's just that... You're dealing with a guy who is the fastest player in the NHL, and like I saw that he hit the post going 43 kilometers an hour, which I think that too contributed to him getting hurt a bit. And like, I, I, if he was just a regular player, I don't even think he gets hurt on that play, even if it was the same manner. It's just that extra speed, I think, caused the problem. And if you look on the replay, McDavid did grab Giordano's stick, and then he kind of lost his own balance and kind of tripped himself a bit. It it was just an unfortunate play. And, it, you know, unless you put players in bubble wrap, they're going to... Freak plays happen, and that was a freak one. And most of the time, it's a nothing play, and 
you know, the guy skates to the penalty box and the other guy skates to the bench. Like, it's no big deal. And it's just, unfortunately, that one had a slightly more disastrous results than it should have been. But I don't see anything wrong with it at all. I think it got blown out of proportion, too, because it was McDavid. Yeah. And we saw the same thing early in his career when someone would do something like that to Sid, and it would get blown out of proportion, too. Yeah, and I'm just glad that he's okay, and like if it was earlier in the season, he might miss a couple weeks, if that. But, you know, with it being the off season, it won't impact him at all, and I'm just glad that he'll be okay, and like you never want to see anybody like that get hurt, period. You don't like to see anybody get hurt, frankly, no. and it, it just, and especially on a stupid play where it's just, you know, like most times like that exact play doesn't result in anything and unfortunately this time it did well for the last time during this regular season uh let's go down to the flames dressing room where we'll hear from some of the flames after this game uh, as the media was asking them questions in the flames dressing room after this battle of alberta and first the captain mark giordano's thoughts on the Connor mcdavid play and what it looked like from his vantage point yeah I feel terrible again i Try to uh, obviously dive and get the puck, and you never want to see. Uh, he's the best player in the game, so we need him uh, in the game and try to find out how he's doing out there. I mean, you're not going to get much from them. They're, they're pretty mad about it, and I understand that. But, uh, no, it was – I honestly thought I could get that puck I, when I dove for it, and watching the replay, uh, I missed it, and stick sort of trips him. So he's, a, he's obviously a great player, and it was tough. I was trying to ask him right away. I think he was uh, – in a lot of pain there, so he wasn't saying much. But uh, I don't know if I, I obviously with the result being what it is. If I had to do it all over again, you'd you'd almost want to see it, see my myself let him go and, and not not injure him. But it's easy to say after the fact. So um, I, I'm going to ask around and hopefully get get an answer and see if he's doing all right. Uh, hopefully it looked like he wasn't wasn't doing well there. And uh, well, obviously my intention was just to get the puck. He's uh, He's a player. I'm not trying to, to make any dirty play on him. I'm just trying to play the one-on-one, -on -one, really. And on a more positive note, getting the captain's thoughts on the first-round matchup against the Colorado Avalanche. Yeah, no, the team was playing well. Uh, plays with a lot of speed and a lot of pace, so we're going we're gonna to prepare for them. I think it's, uh, it's good to get the regular season over with now and crank it up and, and uh, take it to that next level and get these – you know we have we have a few days of re really good days for practice, and we'll we'll prepare for them. And uh, nice to uh, to get the season over with. Did anyone come in sort of at the end of the first period into the dressing room? Did you guys know that Dallas had won was Colorado? No, we we didn't know. We just we're trying to we're trying to play with a lot of detail, trying to play uh, structurally the right way. It's you know it gets tough at times, and uh, um, I thought for the most part we. We got better as the game went on, but uh, couldn't find ways to score tonight. It seemed like couldn't seemed like we couldn't find that next level, and uh, um, I think going into the playoffs now it'll crank up obviously the intensity, and and uh, we'll be ready game one. Travis Hamanick also gave his thoughts about the matchup with the Colorado Avalanche. It'll be a good series. Uh, they got some really good players over there, and uh, some quick players as do we. So. Uh, I'd imagine probably a lot of skating on, on both sides and uh, um, should be good. Yeah. I mean, it is, they're, they're a team that can score. You guys are a team that can score. Is it, it is that the focus or is it tightening things up a little bit and trying to win a couple 2-1? Well, I mean, you'd like to win every game 1-0. So, um, yeah, they're, they're a good team. But we're going to do what we do all year and it's focus on ourselves and, and uh, um, our group. Uh, we got a talented group up and down the lineup. we got some great depth. Um, we got some stars and, and uh, some, some great goaltending, some great D, some great forwards. So we, we got a really good team. We're, we're super excited to, to obviously get going, um, get started, and, and uh, really, really, uh, you know, get to work. And, and uh, uh, like I said, they're, they're a good team. They, they skate quick. Um, it's been good games every time we played them this year, and uh, I would imagine a, a fast-paced series. Outside of specifically the Colorado series, Travis Hamanick shared some of his thoughts generally on the playoffs and what it means for this team. Um, 
Well, you, you want to play hard right, right till the end of the year, and, and uh, you, you want to you know, keep trying to build it. And obviously tonight didn't go as we would like, but um, now everything's in the past. It's, uh, it's a fresh sheet for everybody. You know, you had 16 teams getting in, and everybody's got that one goal, and then it really, truthfully, it doesn't really matter what you've done throughout the season. Um, you know, there's all sorts of, of different things and momentum swings and uh, um, all sorts of different plays that can really impact a series. So it's one of those things you take shift by shift and, and period by period, quite frankly, and um, pluck away at it. Anything can happen. Um, but when you look at it, it's it's exciting. This is you grind 82 games all year. Um, you know, we start the year in China for us, and um, you know, here we get to this point, and, and we've set ourselves up to, to be in the playoffs and in the dance, and now we... Uh, just got to go out and execute like Kim. Yeah, you know, I think we're ready. The fans are ready. The city's ready. Um, you can feel the buzz around the rink, around the city when you're driving. Everyone's, everyone's got the flags in their cars, and, and uh, I mean that's it's, that's awesome. This is the kind of time of year. The weather's nice, and uh, um, you play these games, and the whole city's behind you. So, um, you know, I'm smiling just obviously talking about the playoffs. It's uh, um, it's a great time of year, but at the end of the day. Um, you know, we battled our whole lives to, to have an opportunity to win the cup, um, to get there. Um, so you got to get in the playoffs, and then anything can happen. But for us, we're confident in our group, and and it's another step forward to the goal that we want and, and achieving. You know, um, obviously our goals as a team, but goals for for guys uh, since we've been kids. Thank you. And lastly, we talked to Coach Bill Peters about his thoughts on the playoffs. Coach, obviously opening the first round now. We know against Colorado. What are your thoughts on that matchup? Yeah, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be uh, a good matchup. I think all eight matchups in the league are going to be uh, hotly contested. I thought those teams that were pushing hard to get in have done a real good job to get in, so they're playing well. And uh, we're looking forward to getting started Thursday. I think it's Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, whenever it may be. We're going to come in tomorrow as coaches. We'll give the guys day off, and we'll come in and get dialed in on on Colorado. Now that we know uh, who we're playing, obviously, we'll go and look at their last probably ten games, and then uh, look at our head-to-head -head stuff, and and go from there. But no, we've played them three times too, so we've got a little bit of familiarity with them, and then away we go. Well, Matt, there you go. Kind of what we expected. Just the guys looking forward to the playoffs, and uh, so are we. But before we get there, I thought we would do. You and I always make some predictions about the regular season at the beginning of the season, before it starts. Why don't we look back at those, see how well we did, and then we'll look at the playoffs. Sounds like a plan. So we had a bunch of questions to ask this year, some of the same we ask every year and some were not. But uh, the first question that we tackled was, who will have a breakout season this year? I suggested it would be Mark Jankowski. You thought it would be uh, Austin Zarnick. And if we look at both guys and sort of compare them to last year, um, last year, Mark Jankowski got 25 points in 72 games. This year, he got 32 points in 79 games. Definitely an improvement. I don't know if I'd say it's a breakout year. And Zarnik, um, in played 54 games, got 18 points. In 2016-17, he played 49 games, got 13. So I'd say both guys were got sort a, of a little point. bit more progression in the right direction, but not enough to. Yeah, I would say not anybody. breakout, but the progression we expect. Yeah, Lindholm, I think, is the clear winner of the breakout. When you practically double your career high, I think that's, you know, a clear-cut winner there. And for less than $5 million a year. Yeah, that trade gets better and better every day. It does, and I think it'll only continue that way. Especially with Fox wanting out, and Furland probably not coming back. Yeah, we talked about that last week. It's, uh, I mean, in the end, it doesn't really matter what the other team does. They're, we're not likely to see them at all anyways or have it impact us, but it's looking good for this roster for sure. Yep. Uh, the next question was who we thought would struggle this season. And I suggested it would be Michael Froelich. You thought it would be James Neal. I think we could say that both guys struggled this year. Neal definitely offensively, and I think Froelich has struggled to find his spot in the lineup. Well, um, I, I think Froelich did really good in terms of scoring goals. I think he had 23 or something like that. So I wouldn't necessarily call him struggling. Um, Neil, though, uh, yeah. <laughs> that Neil's was definitely a... struggling the scoreboard. Uh, Froelich has got 34 points, which is more than last year. Remember, he his agent got all upset. He wasn't being oh, yeah, used right. I know. Like... Yeah, and, you know... Like I still wouldn't expect for League to be back after this season. But, no, you know, I think the I, Zucker deal gets done at the draft. Yeah, I it it is what it is. I wouldn't classify him as like a 
like a severe disappointment. No, I think you're right though. James Neal was definitely the guy who struggled this year. We were expecting yeah. a lot more. I mean, when he was when he was signed, he was pretty much expected to be in the uh, in the in the Lindholm spot on the first line. Yeah, and, and to go from there to line three, that's that's quite a struggle. Yeah, and I honestly think that he'll bounce back. Um, you know, it, it, like especially with how he's played since he came back from his injury, he's looking more like James Neal instead of, you know, what was earlier this year. And I think part of that was him conserving energy for the playoffs it, as much as, you know, it, he just didn't look into games uh, where now, like, he's physically imposing himself into the game, and that wasn't the case at all for the first, like, 50 games. Well, we had some audio from him last week where he pretty much said that, you know, he's feeling a lot better after his injury, and he thinks he's back to where he needs to be. I think that there really could be something... Um, I think there could have been a bit of a nagging injury for a lot of the season that we just didn't know about and he was trying to play through. Yeah, and it kind of looked like that as well, and he was a little too tentative, because from what I remember of James Neal, like, I had never really watched a ton of his games, um, just because I don't like Dallas or Pittsburgh, uh, but uh, enough where you know what you're getting from that player, and the, it was not what I recall him playing like, and he was more like Michael Furland in terms of crashing and banging and pouncing on rebounds and such to score goals and we just didn't see that at all for the first 50 games but we have been lately and i wouldn't be shocked if he has a real renaissance in the playoffs i yeah i think you might be right uh the next question we tackled is will mike smith be able to stay healthy you and i were talking at the time about his big injury last year that sort of derailed this team and we both thought no he'll get hurt for a month or so while he was healthy, he did struggle for a while, but wasn't hurt. Yeah. And that, was, that was, that was goalie equipment gone wrong. What's and that? That was goalie equipment gone wrong. And <laughs> Yeah, some people say he was adjusting to new goalie equipment. Um, I think it. I think he's older, too, and I think that probably had something to do with it. Yeah, I, it, I think it was like five different things just all combining to contribute their own little bit to the problem. Then he I, had to work I through it I will say all. I think this is last year in the National Hockey League, but at least he was able to stay healthy. I think that he'll be back somewhere. I actually wouldn't even be entirely shocked if we brought him back. Uh, I would be quite disappointed if we did at his age. I don't know that's the best idea. It would depend on what's available. You know, like as like the plan B situation, like say you're looking at all the other options for goalies and none of them make any sense. Having Smith back for another year, I don't think is the worst idea out there. We'll see. I yeah. think a lot of it will depend on his playoff performance. Oh, I agree. No, he just, like still... El just like Elliot, he looked like a shoe-in to be re-signed, and then the, that playoff series happened, and you have to go away now. <laughs> I'll knock on wood. Smith could still get hurt during the playoffs, but so far he's been able to stay healthy. And at least we have Riddick and Gillies who are both playing well enough, so if anything does happen, we have alternates. One of my favorite questions that we ask every year is who will be the first call-up? Uh, we do a forward and a defenseman. You and I were both right in that Anderson was the first call-up. He was the last guy cut, and we were all surprised he was cut, but uh, he came up and stayed up. And then I thought the first forward to be called up would be Klimchuk, and you thought Mangiapane. Uh, Mangiapane ended up making it. Klimchuk, well, we know that he's not even with the organization now. Yeah. Um, and the, the answer for the first forward was actually Peluso. Yeah, Anthony Peluso, the the big tough guy, and I remember you and I making saying, "Really, that's the guy they're calling up?" And he's been hurt; like he's not even he's not even really here anymore. Yeah, well, he did a very good job in Stockton, and for the type of player he is, he is effective. It's just that, yeah, it, you know, teams need that kind of guy still, and until that completely goes away, guys like him will have a job. I'm going to give myself a partial mark of the next one. The question was, who's the first guy traded? Uh, I'd said Sam Bennett, and then I came back and said, or Froelich, and they did try to move Froelich this year from all accounts. Um, and then you said Michael Stone, who wasn't really traded, but went away for a while. Yeah. 
Um, Magically vanished, and now is back. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the fact that I said, ah, maybe it'll be Froleek, and they tried to move him, and I think that deal gets revisited the draft. Yeah, I still th- I, yeah, and I still think Stone gets moved, too. Like, it's just... Yeah. There's like only a year left on each of those guys, and they're serviceable NHLers. There, there's teams out there that will want that. It's well, just, and this was kind of the year when it was like, don't move a roster player because you know the roster is working so well. We don't want to disrupt it. Oh, for sure. Like you don't want a situation like the Kobasu Ferrance for Stewart and Primo trade, where like on paper it was a good deal, but it just disrupted everything, and the team went to hell. So. You know, you don't want to mess with too much. Uh, the next question is the last regular season question. Then we had two playoff ones. Where will the Flames finish in the regular season in the Pacific Division? I said they'll be second in the Pacific, third at the worst. You said first if goaltending is good, otherwise second or third. We had marginal goaltending, but you still got this one right. Well, I didn't anticipate Elias Lindholm going from okay second liner to all-star caliber, awesome right winger. You know, uh, that definitely compensated for I think Smith. that and the Norris performance from Geo were the two big things. Yeah. And, like, you know, honestly, if it wasn't for uh, Smith's adventures early in the season, the Flames could be right up there with Tampa Bay f- uh, in a fight for first overall. So, you know, it, Calgary, in fact, underperformed this season – with based off of their talent so that's I think good they underperformed in some areas and overperformed in others yeah um it'll be nice to see if especially moving into next season if they can carry on with any of these things and take next forward steps like especially with some of their younger players but well we'll talk about the that in the off season if they can't that's a huge disappointment like this is a roster yeah. that's built to be built upon yep uh, what do the Flames need to do to be successful this season? I said they need to win round two of the playoffs and beat the Ducks. Well, the Ducks aren't even in the playoffs, but I still I think that if they can make it to round two now, that's that's the best thing. But yeah, I think winning round two really, especially where they are, uh, none of us thought they'd be first in the West. Winning round two would be an excellent season for these guys. I think that uh, at a minimum, getting to the second round. And I agree. not getting their behinds handed to them in the second round. You know, like if they lose in like game seven in the second round, that's fine. If they get swept in the second round, then that's not fine. <laughs> and your uh, your key to success this year was a dogfight for the division title. I'll give you a partial point because well, we were in about a three-week dogfight with San Jose to stay on top of them. Yeah. It was right down to the wire. It's it just, was. I said and, that for a month. It's going to come down to that one game. Yeah, and it did. And Calgary just, you know, San Jose kind of more imploded than anything. And Calgary's like, oh, thanks for getting out of our way. Thank you. And the last <laughs> question that we had was, how far can the Flames go in the playoffs this year? And I said third round or bust. You said third round. And I still think now, I think they did better than we all thought, but... They can definitely make the third round, I think. I think that with them having the easy road in terms of they have the weakest opponent in round one, they'll have a battered opponent in round two if they get there. And all four of the central teams are basically the same. So, like, they're going to be battered by the time they get to the conference finals. The Flames could get to the Stanley Cup finals... As long as they don't get in their own way. And like, and if, I think as long as their goaltending holds up. And that's exactly what I was going to mean. Like, if Smith and Riddick just play okay. Like, you don't need them to go, like, Vesna Trophy caliber goaltending. You just need them to hold the fort and not give up Elliott-level stinkers every game. You know, and if they can get just adequate goaltending, they should be able to go all the way to the Stanley Cup Finals. Because yeah. they're better than everybody else, and all the other teams will be battered by the time we face them. So, Calgary should be able to go far, and then it's just a matter of which team we face in the Stanley Cup Finals. If it's Tampa Bay, we're screwed. <laughs> I still think Tampa's going to get taken out. So do I. 
and because you got to figure they're gonna have to. Columbus is gonna be desperate to just save any sort of. I don't face. think it'll be Columbus that does it. No, but they're gonna give them a, a hard time, as hard of a time that they can. I don't see that game series going past five, really. But then my you, crazy prediction is Tampa gets taken out. Boston and Washington beat the crap out of each other in the Eastern Final, and we take on the winner of that, which I think will be Boston. Yep, that's. Uh, well, you know, it's kind of weird because we we're both on the same page. We might as well go back to China for that series. Yeah. Well, I was, you know, last I, I week... think it'd just be kind of cool because that's all where it started this year, us in Boston and China. And for that to be where it ends, it kind of sums the season up nicely. Yeah. That'd be a weird storyline. But yeah, um, last week you mentioned that, oh, I think St. Louis is going to be the central division champion and like we're on the same page and we're both seeing the same in the east it's kind of weird that like our brackets are basically the same well if we take a look at moneypuck.com they have their playoff odds up um and some interesting numbers there so calgary according to their odds and you can go to the site and read about how these are calculated we'll post a link in the show notes if anyone's interested um but they're usually pretty good with their odds uh, 61.4% of making round two. To me, that's a little low, but yeah, okay. And making round three, 29.4% chance. So, yeah, I think, you know, based on that, and the Flames having a 16.7% chance of making the finals and 83 of winning the cup, that number sounds about right to me. The thing that's a little shocking to me is they have San Jose, Vegas, and St. Louis above Calgary. Yeah. Well, and if you look at a lot of the Las Vegas odds makers, Calgary's number two or three on the list. Well, you have to remember that we're a small market team, and nobody cares. Well, but that's the thing for here. These are, and, for these ones, these are money pucks. These are all based on numbers. Yeah, and like you look at like uh, on the NHL Network, Kevin Weeks and uh, I can't remember who the other guy was was uh, saying that like they had the Flames ranked seventh of the eight teams in terms of who they think will make the finals and like only ahead of Colorado. So I think a lot of media people are kind of underestimating Calgary. Well, the NHL network tends tailored to the Eastern U S market. If you look at TSN, they think Toronto is going to win the Stanley cup and the KHL trophy and the Swedish trophy and the, you know, the universal hockey trophy playing against the team from Mars. Like, wow, the Leafs in the playoffs, they will win all the things. Yeah. Enjoy your five games and then bye bye. <laughs> but you know, so yeah, you're right. It depends who you know where yeah. you get that from. But that's why I like Money Puck here because it's based on numbers. It's not based on anyone's yeah. feeling or you know their gut. Yeah, and like looking at the entirety of each of the teams in the West, the, the only thing that Calgary is really lacking is solid goaltending, where like every other team has like foundational issues and. Calgary and like our goaltending issues aren't even as bad as San Jose's so it's one of those things where like all of the teams in the west have a clear weakness in one regard or another it's just that Calgary's weaknesses are not as big of a deal in terms of because like if you look at the teams that traditionally go far in the I playoffs I'd say they they're not as big a deal I think they've been able to hide them better yeah, you look at the teams that go far in the playoffs, they're the ones that have like the third and fourth lines contributing and six defensemen that are doing well. And Calgary is the only team in the West that can say that. So it just based on that alone, like unless you're having a goaltender pulling a Yaroslav Halak uh, from like 2010 against Washington when he was with Montreal... Like, unless something like that happens where the guy just goes into god mode for goaltending, I don't see anyone clearly being better than Calgary. And that's the only thing that I could see tripping them up is if the goaltenders, one of them just stands on their head. We'll talk about our individual series in a sec, but let's keep talking about Calgary as a whole going into this one. Um, I think that... Calgary's goaltending could become an issue in this playoff run, but the question is, can they outscore 
their goaltending deficit, which I think has been the story of the year. If they didn't have such a strong scoring lineup, I think we wouldn't be where we were because we've essentially outscored our deficit. And you look at how many games we've had three or four goals scored against us, but we're outscoring that. So I think that's going to be the the question in the playoffs. Can well, we like look at that game in Columbus, uh, that game in Columbus in December where the Flames were down, I think five one, and then one nine to six. Yeah, it, you know it. The Flames can do that. It's just... But, I mean, how many times this season have I said to you, you know, if we get four scored against us, we should be losing. And we've won those games. I know there's been at least a couple weeks I've I've mentioned that to you on the show. Like, yeah, this team has not got great goaltending, but we just need to outscore our goaltending yeah. deficiency. Yeah, and if you look at, like, uh, the second game that we played against the Avalanche, the, they went into the third period up 4-1, to one, and we won 6-5. Yep. and Calgary can do that. It's just that one of the differences between like the 2018 portion of the season and the 2019 is that both goalies are playing solidly, and Smith for like most of 2018 was horrible, frankly, and uh, like we had mentioned many times of like get any goaltender in the NHL it'll be better than what we're getting but he uh, to his credit has stepped up and has been providing slightly above league average goaltending since the start of the calendar year that's like to hear going into a deep playoff series we're getting above league just above league average goaltending hey that's better than dead last <laughs> you know so it, it's not ideal like you'd all obviously you'd like to have a guy like a Carey price or you know dominic hasek or patrick Waugh or you know insert like awesome goaltender here calgary just doesn't have one of those right at this point that well, might you... change moving forward and i think it will it's just that you know for right now we don't and just having above average goaltending, I think, will be enough just because the rest of the team is awesome. You usually get one team who, and this was Calgary in 04, who rides quite far on the back of a goaltender. I yeah. don't know which team that's going to be this year. Probably St. Louis. Yeah. Um, you know, and then you get one team who usually goes far and they've got some deficiencies. You go, huh, how are these guys, you know, going as far as they are? And I think that might be the Calgary team this year. You look at, like, other teams, and, like, I'm just going to use Colorado, for example, and of their six defensemen, only one I'd consider able to play in the Flames' top six, and that's Eric Johnson. So, like, other teams just don't have the depth that Calgary does, and I think that that's going to be the great equalizer, is that the Flames can just roll four lines and three pairings, and they're all good, and... Like, there's no lousy player playing on any of the 18 roster spots. So, where other teams, like, they might have three or four or five or six guys that are questionable. <laughs> guys like Troy Brower last year type of thing, where, like, they're an NHL player, but they're not good at all. And Calgary doesn't have anybody that's deficient like that. And I think that that will be the thing that will help us to overcome any problems well let's look at the first such problem that could happen and that's our first round opponent you and i talked about who we'd like to draw here and we didn't get our first choice which was uh the desert dogs but we got our second choice and the most likely which is a round one ma matchup against the colorado avalanche and that's our the first time these two teams have ever met in the postseason so um, it's a song of ice and fire you know there you go for yeah, all I the mean, Game Col of Thrones fans out there, so, you know. Colorado, pretty dominant team in the 90s when they had Hashik and Forsberg and that, when we weren't, and so this is our first meeting. Um, just to recap, because I know a lot of people have been wanting to know, games have been scheduled. Game 1 will be in Calgary on the 11th at 8 p.m. Game 2 will be in Calgary on Saturday the 13th at 8.30 p.m. Games 3 and 4 will be in Colorado on the 15th and 17th, both 8 p.m. Mountain. So we get... We get the late shift, Matt. Yep. The Rocky Mountain Rumble. Let's but at go. least it's not too far to go. Not a huge no. change in altitude, all those things. So let's It'll actually right be in. interesting if any of the teams in our division make it to the finals because they'll have played in each time zone, each one series in each time zone. 
because uh the sharks in vegas are both in the pacific time zone uh we're in the mountain uh the central teams are all in the central time zone in the east obviously and as weird east. as it sounds those are things that mess the players up change in time change of altitude but you think Calgary, Colorado being similar altitudes, similar, you know, same time zone, it's going to make it easy for these players to adjust whether it's at home or on the road. Yep. Well, let's jump in and talk about some of the keys to victory. You said you've spent your day scouting the Colorado Avalanche. What do we know about these guys and what do we need to be worried about? Well, their first line is awesome, frankly. Uh, Miko Rantanen, uh, Gabriel Landis Cog, and Nathan McKinnon, they're as good as the Flames' first line. Actually, they're slightly better, I I, I would say. To but, me, I think the big advantage for the Flames is that we get last change, so we can put 3M out against those guys every shift yeah. we want to. And both Landis Cog and Rantanen are dealing with injuries. And like, uh, Rantanen's still not wearing a contact jersey yet, and I think he's doubtful for Game 1, maybe even Game 2. And Alexander so. Kerfoot is on that line in the meantime. Yeah, and that's not... You may ask the same uh, that, question I did. Who? Well, he's an all-right player. Uh, it's just... It's like shoehorning Sam Bennett in there. It's like, uh, yeah, okay, that that's awesome, great, yay. <laughs> that's not going to replace anything, but hey, good for you. <laughs> Do something with your ice time. So, yeah, the, it's... Then, once you get past the first line, their second, third, and fourth lines are kind of bad. Like, uh, Soderberg is okay, uh, and he's an alright second line guy. Kerfoot's an so alright second line guy, but... So that second line for Colorado right now is Colin Wilson, Carl Soderberg, and JT Comfer, and... I was saying to you before the show, if you look at this lineup, it reminds me a lot of Calgary's 04 lineup, and it's a bunch of pieces that you didn't know where they ended up, or they were kind of, you know, oh, that guy's still in the league. It's almost like the, you know, the yeah, uh, like what Comf are they called in Toy Story, the Island of Lost Toys? Yeah, like, Comfer and Wilson are all right players, but, like, Wilson shouldn't be above anybody's third line. He, he shouldn't even be on the f third line, even. And yet he's on their second line. And that would be like having Garnett Hathaway on your second line. Like, you can do that. It's just... Well, and Soderbergh's yeah. a guy I'm kind of surprised is still in the NHL, much less in the second line role. Well, he didn't have a bad year, 49 points. So, and, and you know, their that's line adequate. Is, their third line is Matthew Naito, uh, Derek Broussard, and Matt Calvert. Again, um, Matt Calvert's still around, really? Yeah. Well, Brassard, Brassard is going downhill significantly. He's played on three teams this year. Uh, 40 games for Pittsburgh, 10 for Florida, and now 20 for Colorado. He's not good, and he's going down and out. Like He's, he, he's basically a fourth liner now, but he's on the third line. Matthew Nato is fast, and that's about it. He was a prospect who I think they had a lot more... Uh, they were expecting a lot more from. Yeah, like uh, I think they were hoping that he'd turn into a second line forward, but he's looking like end stage Rene Bork right at this point, where he's fast and he can get a good shot every once in a while, but that's about it. And their fourth line is uh, I can never say his name Sven Andragato. Yeah, T Tyson Yost and Gabriel Bork. And again, I'm looking at this saying. Gabriel Bork's again one of those guys that's floated around the league a lot. Like that's the best you've got there. Yeah. Like the thing is with that fourth line, they're quick. Yay. Like Yost uh, was a former tenth overall pick, and he just hasn't really done. Well, when Broussard is above you in the lineup, you know that you're not very good. Yeah, and he's kind of plateauing as being a depth guy, and yeah. So, like, Colorado really, like, once you get past that first line, it's really not good. Let's look at their uh, D pairings. Their first pairing is Samuel Gerrard and Eric Johnson. Eric Johnson's another one of those guys I think his best hockey's behind him. Yeah, it, he's basically like Travis Hamanick, but not as good. It, yeah, yeah. It, it, he's got a better slap shot. But that's about it. Like, he's a defensive defenseman, 
and he's there. Like, uh, he's perhaps one of the worst top pairing defensemen in the NHL. Like, I, he, yeah, on most teams, he's a number three, four guy or worse. Like, There's... honestly, on the Flames, I, I think he'd be on the third pairing. But... Yeah, probably. Um, their second pairing is guys that I think both held potential at one point, and the, they were hoping to get them back, and that's Nikita Zadorov and Tyson Berry. Barry was a highly touted prospect. Zadorov's only 23. I think he's still got some growing to do. I think Zadorov could get much better. Yeah, Zadorov is a little undisciplined, and he's a physically imposing guy. He's six foot five, and if anybody's gonna create some disturbance, it'll be either him or Ian Cole. Uh, Frankly, only Colin Wilson and those two defensemen are physical players for the Avalanche. They don't really have a ton of bruising type forwards or defensemen. Um, with uh, both Gerard and uh, Barry, they're both undersized. They're only five foot ten. Um, Gerard's better defensively than Barry, and Barry's a tire fire defensively. He'll score you a lot of points, but, you know, you don't want him out there against anybody good. Well, and, and I was about to say that. If you look at it, I think especially when we get last change here in Calgary of these three pairs, you're trying to put your first two lines up against the Zadorov berry pair. Yeah, exactly. And, and, their, and their third pair is Ian Cole and Patrick Nemeth. Which would basically be like Brett Kulak and, uh, yeah some other version they're in like they're both bad tyler watherspoon yeah there you go um, like like honestly neither of those guys even come close to touching the lineup uh, dalton pro there you go cole pro about the same there you go i was thinking back what goalies does matt want to convert to a winger pick one of those guys yeah. <laughs> Usually take our worst defenseman, say make him a winger. And actually it was funny in the Edmonton game because there's a few times Johnny was off his uh, off his mark and Prout was going on the wing. And I'm like, hey, maybe Matt's got something going here. Yes. <laughs> um, anyway, well, hey, to- that, that's, a, that's a way to get some extra physicality in the lineup. Keep but- the defense pairings the same, but, you know, just sub Manjapani out for Prout just to, you know, wreak some havoc. Well, in that game, when nothing matters, at some point, put four defensemen on the ice with, you know, Ryan to win a faceoff and see what you get. Yeah. That's why I'm not an NHL coach. I'd be like, yeah, it doesn't uh, well, matter. I remember uh, Mike Keenan once put a power play out, and it was five defensemen because he was so pissed at the team. So, you know, uh, uh, yeah. That's why I'm not an NHL coach. I'd be like, yeah, this one doesn't matter. Let's draw names out of a hat to see who's going on next. Yep. Uh, Harvey, you're up. Put the t-shirt cannon down. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody throw your sticks at center ice, and, you know, we'll just ferret out the lines that way. Where, where's that kid who carries the flag? You're up at, you're up at right wing. Yep. Um, and then the one area that I think, I think on paper, Colorado beats us in is goaltending. They have two, I think, good enough goalies. Yeah. Uh, um, Semyon Varlamov, you may not like the guy, but he's proven that he's an NHL starter. And I think he's going to get big money in the offseason. And Philip Grubauer is one of those guys you and I have talked about where he was a backup that was ready to break out, and he's had that chance to do it in Colorado. Yeah, and Grubauer is the only reason why the Avalanche are in the playoffs. He went on a tear at the end of the season, and he was awesome, frankly. And he's the only real concern that the Flames have. Well, and that's the thing. Unlike a lot of teams where, okay, our number one guy's out, you know, we're screwed. I think you can play either of those goalies, and you're going to have good enough goaltending. Yeah, and Grubauer has struggled in the postseason before. Uh, Like last year with Washington, he was terrible in the couple of games he played, and Holtby came in and obviously won the cup, so... um, Colorado has always been a team this season that they tend to give up more shots than they take because especially because their defense is so bad and like they're able to win games just because their first line is so awesome but um i remember the games that the flames played against them and the flames just basically put the boots to them uh on the shot clock and it wore them down and in each game like the first game uh the flames were down to nothing after like two minutes and ended up winning that game in overtime they were down 4-1 a 
because of some Mike Smith specials in the second one, and we're able to wear them down. And Is that a thing now? Well, bad goals early in the season. It's a Mike Smith special. I'm just <laughs> pulling up the games here, the recaps. Yeah. And the third one, I think the Flames that uh, controlled the game a lot better. But the goaltending, like, we didn't face Grubauer this season. Uh, all three were Varlamov. Um, I'm not overly concerned. Uh, I'm like, not overly concerned, but I think that they, of all the Western teams, I think they have one of the better tandems. I agree. And like, I think it's if one guy's not doing well, you're okay to throw the other guy in. Yeah. And I think Calgary is all right in that situation as well. On paper, I like their tandem better than ours, just because they both have yeah. some playoff experience. Yeah. I think the tandem as a whole has looked better this year. They haven't had one guy like ours who was really, I mean, we were wondering if he should be in the National Hockey League for part of the year. Yeah. Oh, I agree. And it'll be interesting to see. And Colorado is also a team and I, this is why I'm definitely expecting Mike Smith to get the bulk of the starts in round one is not only historically he dominated Colorado, but, uh, Colorado uses the dump and chase, uh, as the main driver for their offense. And Smith is excellent at interrupting that. So, Colorado, uh, to what you're going to see from them is they're a very fast team that has very little talent, but if you make mistakes, they will pounce on them and counterattack quite effectively. And I think one of the things Calgary is going to have to do to win is slow them down in the offensive zone. Keep them to the, keep them to the boards, keep them on the outside and try to slow them down. Yeah. And that's part of, like, why having Smith in that, and if Smith's playing well enough where he deserves to be there, will be important because that removes one of the tools that Colorado has to generating their cycle game going and all that. The so. worry I have with Smith, if he's there because of their speed, he generally tends, when he plays the puck behind the net, to get caught behind it, and I'm worried that with their speed, they could capitalize on his on his puck handling. I, I wouldn't be shocked if a goal is scored like that, but I think that on the whole, having him interrupting them will have a better net benefit than him, you know, his adventures behind the net. So looking back at the three games this season against the Avalanche, we played them October 13th. Uh, that game, Calgary won 3-2. to two. We outshot them 41 to 26 and uh, won in the faceoff dot by 56%. Uh, the next game was November 1st. We played them. We outshot them 37 26. Lost in the faceoff dot with only 49% of our wins. Um, and then the last game was January 9th and they outshot us quite a bit 36 16, but we still beat them 5 to 3. Yeah, that was one of those games where we scored a lot and then just didn't really care. It's funny because, you know, we only got 16 shots, but as my grandfather would say, looking at this, said, we were more efficient with our shots. We took less and scored more. And I'm like, well, that's not really the way hockey works, but okay. Well, it, that's why, like, Corsi bugs me because if you manage to score several goals early, you're not going to be trying to continue to score. You're going to just be like, okay, you know, don't screw it up. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and you're not going to be driving the play as much because, you know, you're, you're in control. So, like, I, I, that's one of the gripes I've always had with Corsi and all that is that it doesn't put context into things. And, like, a game like that where, like, oh, yeah, we definitely lost the Corsi battle handily uh but uh, I remember that game like Colorado was just throwing everything at the net just trying to get anything going and Calgary's like yeah okay <laughs> and an interesting stat I found this week the abs have had a 22 percent um success rate on the power play compared to the flames 19.3 which means they're slightly more successful than us um, and their top scorers were more productive on the man advantage. However, the Avs take more penalties on average than the Flames do. The Avs clocked uh, 9 minutes and 24 se seconds average throughout the year, where the Flames were at 8 minutes 28 seconds. So 
I, I think one of the keys here is going to be who can stay out of the box. Yeah, and that's where guys like Zadorov and Cole, uh, they and even Johnson, they they tend to take some dumb, 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 dumb penalties at times. Um, with Cole and Zadorov specifically, they tend to get angry, and that leads them to do dumb things. <laughs> oh, Zadorov angry! Oh, yeah. Zadorov want to hit. Yeah, and so I'm sure that uh, Kachuk and Hathaway's job is to annoy the crap out of those guys, so then they do dumb things. And I think that's how one of the ways that the Flames are going to exploit the Avalanche is by picking on those two guys. And especially because neither one of them is fleet of foot, they tend to take a lot of hooking penalties because they get beat and, oh, we we have to do something here. So... <laughs> Colorado is faster, like you said, in the offensive zone. I think they have the slower defensemen. Yeah, I agree. And and I think a big key to Calgary, well, both teams' success, whoever's successful here is going to be to to put those jets on in the offensive zone. Yeah, and Calgary, I think, can better weather that because all of our defensemen are rather fast relative to Colorado's. And... Yeah, you know, they can handle that. And well, generally the way you defend against a big team is throwing the body, and I think we have a we have a better defensive. I mean, they have more guys that can hit, but after that, they're kind of useless. I think we have a better team that can throw the body and then get the puck out of our zone. Yeah, and also using your body in the proper way to separate the player from the puck. And like Nick Lidstrom uh, used to be able to That's just good point. He never would throw a hit at all, but he, yet he'd just take the puck right off of players. And uh, Giordano and a few others can have that ability to just separate players from the puck without having to smash them into the boards. So For, for me, if I look at the big keys to victory, I think um, one is going to be taking advantage of the fact Colorado has some key injuries early in the season and trying to you know capitalize on that with our first line. I also think the keys to victory at home when we get the last change is going to be keeping that 3M line out there to neutralize their first line, and we're going to need our depth scorers to come to play. We can't rely on that first line to win us this, ser this series. Yeah, and it'll be imperative to for Bennett, Neal, Hathaway, and uh, Hamannick to smash them repeatedly, often, and cleanly. <laughs> Well, and I, and I think that's the thing. You're going to have to play, like you said, do it smart, but play the body and tie up their first line. Yeah. Um, yeah. Outside uh, their first line, I'm really not too worried about anybody on that team. It's just kind of a hodgepodge of third line guys. Yeah. And so, like, if the guys, the Flames physical guys, because especially because Colorado's by and large a small team, mm -hmm. like, there's only a few players that are over, like, 6'1". On that that team, so if we you got send some small guys here too, Matt. Yeah, but not to the same extent, and it's not like every single guy is small. It, where with Colorado, it's pretty much every single guy. I don't know; these guys were all in Anaheim last week. I doubt Goudreau, Mangiapane, and Ryan probably could have gone and done much at Disneyland. We got some small guys here too. Yeah, I know, but you know, couldn't go most of the rides. True, but you know, you're also looking at. Colorado who has like seven guys that are like under six feet so I think if I look at the Flames lineup that obviously the 3M line is going to be useful for containing them but I think that the Bennett Jankowski Neal line that third line are going to be looked at to play a little more physical game against Colorado's top line as well yeah and basically the third and fourth line need to just go out and create havoc. Garnett Hathaway needs to be vintage Garnett Hathaway smash people Take the puck to the front of the net and score. <laughs> See, it's weird because usually you wouldn't think this, but I think going into this round, the first line is going to probably light it up, which you'd expect because they're going to be playing against uh, not so great uh, defensemen. I think the second and third line are going to be, and that's let's call that the 3M line and the Bennett Jankowski Neal line, are going to be, at least in the first couple games, so focused on being more defensively minded. I honestly think this, the line that might get the second most offense is the Mangiapane ryan hathaway line. I agree. And you have to look at the Avalanche. Like, their defense, they only have two players 
that I think would even play on the Flames' defense at all, and that's Gerard and Johnson, and both of them would be the number six. So, like, they're... I don't they're, know if I'd put Johnson that far. Well, I guess on this year's team, maybe that far down, but... Yeah. I mean, and he's, he's still a good defender. Yeah, but, like, they're not... None of them... Like, they, they only have two guys that are good, is what I'm trying to get at. And... Like, they're going to see the lion's share of the time against the Gaudreau line. And if that's the case, then the Flames can feast on the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth guys. Because they all are bad. And, it, you know, like, for a playoff team, they're not good. So, uh, it, there will be plenty of opportunities for the Flames to generate offense and make some Swiss cheese out of that defense. And... I don't think this is like I don't think they're so bad that this is a four game sweep. I think that there's still some pieces that you need to be worried about, but I think Calgary has to come out and play like the Calgary Flames that we saw playing before the break, the uh the one week by week break. And if this whole team is clicking, they're going to have no problems. If we get that if first the Flames struggling, it, honestly, if the Flames are clicking, this is a four game and done. You think so? If if the Flames are clicking, It'll be a four game. I can if see the Colorado Flames, taking one in their own barn. If the Flames play their game their way and don't get in their own way by like the goaltender, mm -hmm. you know, like Elliot last time, uh, if they don't get in their own way, this series really should be over in five. I think five is reasonable. I think four is. I think the Flames are going to, whoever they start in net. They're going to ride them too long, and it's going to cost them one game. Possible. It It's one of those where the, I don't think the Calgary Flames have actually ever swept anybody in their history. If they're ever going to do it, this would be the time, but I don't see that happening. According and, to Money Puck, uh, there is an 8.1% chance Calgary sweeps and a 4.1% chance Colorado sweeps. Yeah. Well, that wouldn't happen. If if Colorado sweeps this series, uh, I think we're next behind the Oilers to fire everyone on hockey ops. No, no. That, I think that that's one of those where if the Flames get swept, several things would have hap would have to happen wrongly. One, the goaltenders will have to implode because if the goaltenders do not implode, we are not getting swept. So. Step one, get new goaltenders. <laughs> Step two is, you know, whatever other problems happen, fix them too. <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, yeah. It, Colorado, like Nashville the other lot, couple years ago when they beat Chicago and swept them in the first round, Nashville was at least a very good defensive team with a goaltender. Colorado does not have anyone that's anywhere near as good defensively as any of the players that Nashville had. So uh, that's not going to happen. Like, uh, honestly, I don't even see Calgary losing this series, frankly. Like, I, I don't see any scenario unless Grubauer pulls like a Yaroslav Halak and even then it would be a seven-game series. Like, I just, I don't see any realistic way where Calgary loses this series. No, I don't either, but I, I think four games is maybe a stretch. Yeah. I think five is doable. I, I personally think it's going to be six. Yeah. Um, I The big, another big advantage for Calgary here is, according to Peters today, and I asked him this after the Edmonton game, um, he told us Ben would play again the regular season. He didn't, but according to Peters today, our entire squad is healthy. Yeah. Well, plus, you don't want Bennett accidentally getting hit, and Bennett is enough of a disturber where he kind of has a little bit of enemies here, there, and everywhere, so you don't want him to accidentally get clipped like he did in the LA game, so just it's better to have him and Kachuk ready for game one. And if you look at even the spare parts Calgary has right now, like we've talked about the defense, but... Um... You know, Oliver Shillington, Michael Stone, and Yusuf Valamaki, Dalton Proud is your, you know, fifth and sixth pairs, or I guess fourth and fifth pairs. 
you've got no problems there against Colorado and Dubé, Quine, and Zarnik as your essentially fifth line of forwards. Like the Flames have a lot of pieces they can cycle in and out, and I think that's going to be a key to winning not just the first round, but you know, sitting guys at the right time and moving those pieces around as needed. Yeah, and I think that you'll see a lot of fluidity to the lineup. And like, if any one player struggles badly, I could see them getting swapped out for another part. Or even that guy who, you know, takes a hit the wrong way and you just sit him precautionary for the next game. Yeah, true enough. Because you've got the piece. Yeah, exactly. You know, I think, especially in the playoffs, with as deep of a team as we've got, you know, unless it's, say, Lindholm or Monaghan or Goudreau, but if I'm looking at the bottom two pairings, or, sorry, bottom two lines, Bennett, Jankowski, Neil, Hathaway, Ryan, Majibani, I'd be okay to swap out any of those six with Dubé, Quine, or Zarnik. Yeah, exactly. And same thing on the defense, unless it's Geo or, you know, Hamannick or Hannafin, I'd be okay moving Valimaki, Prout, Shillington, or Stone in there. Yep. And I think Valimaki is number one to go in. Yeah, I think you're right. And and I think, too, I don't know, I hate to say it this way because it sounds kind of weird, but I think there's a little bit of a confusion tactic of just moving guys around the lineup, too. Yeah. Especially in a long series where you've seen one guy for four games and all of a sudden he's gone and someone else is in there. Oh, yeah, I know. And having that versatility and the fact that we have so many players that can play, Mm -hmm. which is bizarre. Like, Calgary, seriously, like, our fifth line and fourth pairing defense are better than half of the team's fourth lines and third pairings that are in the West. Like, it, Well, and if you look at a lot of our depth guys in the past, we've had these guys that are sort of hanger-ons that shouldn't be here. Your Freddie Hamilton's, you know, your... Stajan, Brower. Yeah, I mean, these guys that are sort of Linden Vey, like, you know, they're sort of here and they're NHL players, and it's like, okay, they're here. Hopefully they don't need to play. Yeah, but you're you know, a Nick, body. Nick Grossman, like, you know, I think it's one yeah. of those, yeah, okay, this shows that not only this year, but going forward... We're going to have to make some tough decisions, and you better play well or you're out of here because we got a guy waiting for your spot. Yeah, exactly. And that's where, like, I could see the Flames making a trade or two where they trade two pieces for one better piece, consolidating yeah. some talent. I think you're going to see st- players shipped out for picks this year. but That too. There's a lot of options, but that that's after we win the Cup, you know. So. Knock on wood. We'll see. <laughs> um... So, th- so the- today at practice, we saw Mike Smith in the starters net for the Flames. Uh, who do you think on Thursday when the Flames open the playoffs, who do you think they should put in that starters net? Uh, at Halfway through March when Smith started playing, or February, I mean, when Smith started playing well, I said Smith was going to be the game one starter, and not a thing has changed my opinion. Um He's doing very good. He's experienced. He's gone to the conference finals before. He's good when he's on. He's on. So let's go. See, and, and I I go back and forth on this about every five minutes. Yeah, he's been in the playoffs, but it's been, what, like seven years since he's been in the playoffs? Yeah, well, that's not uh, his fault that Arizona was freaking terrible. I don't know if your you playoff know. experience can, like, wash away after time or how that works, but... Um, he for a number of those years he was the only reason why Arizona was not the single worst team in the league and even then sometimes they were the worst team in the league and it wasn't his fault so hashtag losing yeah hashtag Arizona needs to be relocated um <laughs> but yeah no um we could we could do the NHL shuffle, move Ottawa to Quebec City, and then Arizona to, to Ottawa. Ottawa. Yeah, there you go. Um, I I think if you look at the season, they played Riddick twice against Colorado and Smith once. See, and like I said, I'm going back and forth on this every couple of minutes. I think Smith has definitely come around, and I think he'll get game one. I think if I were the Flames, I would give each one of the goalies one of the home games. I would wait and see how Smith does. Like, if Smith plays well and, like, doesn't give up any embarrassing goals, you just ride him until he does. And, like, if Smith has a really bad game at any point, you yank him, like, as you have that leash being so short that 
you know, like if he gives up a real stinker of a goal, yank him. That was the next thing I was going to say is any game that Smith is in, he's got a really short leash. Yeah. Uh, like if he lets in a, like a what the hell are you doing type goal like Elliot did in that playoff run, just yank him. You have a perfectly viable other guy. Throw him in there and, you know, let Riddick play until he starts to suck and just bounce back and forth you know like i'm not adverse to like honestly say the flames go to the stanley cup finals and they play 25 games honestly i'm expecting one guy to play about 15 and the other guy about 10 how many playoff games do you need to, as a goalie to get your name on the cup is it two i think so yeah um see nobody does this but the rule book doesn't say you can only swap goalies once and nobody ever does it but you could say hey smitty you had a bad goal against you let's sit you on the bench for 10 minutes let you cool down put reddick in and then put smitty back in i was saying they're gonna do it but yeah nothing in the rule book says you can't swap your goalies again oh yeah no it's just that would be a little weird well and... i don't know there's a lot of times your goalies get emotional and i think if you just let them sit down for a couple minutes and compose themselves or go down the tunnel and compose themselves, you might be okay again. Yeah. Uh, that would be a little risky, I think, because you're getting a guy cold and, you, you know. There's I don't know like, how cold he's going to be. You you get him off the ice for a minute? I mean, you Well, no, I'm meaning, like, Riddick coming in for a minute. Like, another goal could be scored. Uh, that'd be kind of risky. I, I would be adverse to doing that. Like, if you're going to pull him, you pull him, and that's it for the night for you. Yeah, but. I don't know. It's This is probably why, you know, even the Oilers won't hire me as their head coach, because I have these radical ideas. Well, you couldn't do any worse. <laughs> like, really. Like, <laughs> I, like, honestly, it's almost as if they're trying to be bad. Like, Well, it, we'll take a quick segue here. I did some research as the intrepid reporter I am at the Battle of Alberta game. I talked to 12 different Oilers fans, and I've come to the conclusion that I asked all of them, why are you cheering for the Oilers? Like, I legitimately want to know what there is to cheer for. And I've come to the conclusion that cheering for the Oilers is like women who wear ripped jeans. People don't seem to know why they're fashionable, but they do it anyways. Yeah. And everyone I talked to, I either got the, well, I was there in 80, in, you know, the 80s, or oh, I was born in Edmonton, to which I apologize for. Um, or it was, oh, I like the colors, to which I thought, well, you must have a poor taste in colors i hate to see what color your house is painted so no good nobody gave me a good answer for what they're cheering for well you know the flames like when they were awful in the late 90s and early 2000s at least like the the rosters sucked like it, it was a gimla beret and nothing for a number of those years and you know at least they tried like they were awful but at least they gave a good effort the Sounds oilers like what you say to your kids timbits team yeah you gave it your all <laughs> you suck but hey good for you uh but you know the <laughs> the oilers though like mcdavid dry and nugent hopkins to their credit look like very good top six forwards the rest of their team, though, like, it's like the rest of their team is, like, all Troy Brower. Forward and defenseman equivalents. Where, like, you really shouldn't be in the NHL at all, and you're just kind of there earning a paycheck. There's 31 teams now. they got to fill rosters. Yeah. Usually, though, you have more than three guys on your roster, and the Oilers, unfortunately, only do have three. And... You know, to their credit, if they can get anybody who's an actual NHL player, they'll be a playoff team. You know, I'm talking to a couple of the beat writers, that's their issue. Is nobody wants to play there, so you can't get many free agents. You've got to, as this guy said, trick them into playing there by trading for them. Yeah, and that's why, like, if it was me, I'd just sit those three guys down and say, hey, boys, we're going to suck but we're going to get a bunch of good draft picks to surround you guys with some players that actually know what end of the stick is up. We don't have that right now. Just please bear with us. Stand by while we actually try and to fix And if I was us. McDavid, I'd put my hand up and say, uh, you haven't been able to draft well outside of the first round in the last 10 years. How long is this going to take? 
uh yeah step one fire the scouting staff <laughs> uh, may, they might be better to have those three guys do a telethon and call everyone in the nhl hi this is Connor mcdavid how would you feel about being traded to the edmonton oilers we'd love to have you you are an nhl player you are better than what we have your support is very important to us please <laughs> tell your general manager i want to go to edmonton see you in september <laughs> Yeah, no, like, like honestly, they could if, use one of those politicians robo dialers and just call everyone's cell number and plays in the league. Yeah, like honestly, if the Oilers even got, uh, say, six or seven guys who are the equivalent of Derek Ryan, like not world beaters, but just decent, solid NHL players, that's a playoff team. Just because those three guys are that good, it's just getting those actual NHL caliber parts which yeah um yeah well let's go back to the flames we've uh I think well we gotta those. we gotta make fun of edmonton this is our last time until tomorrow you make it sound like forever like they're being relocated or something well till tomorrow when they lose the draft lottery and then and then they f and, then and they the rangers the and and the rangers win the the draft lottery and then we can pick make even more fun of them for winning that last game so we'll add a segment in next week yes um so looking at the flames usually there's a couple players who always stand out to you that unlikely or unsung hero of the playoffs or at least the, the guy that we didn't expect to come alive last time the flames were in the playoffs that was michael furland he was sort of the garnet hathaway the sandpaper guy who really came out scored a lot of goals um you know really helped the team in ways that he probably shouldn't have otherwise. Yeah. Who do you think is going to be that unsung hero this year? You said him. Garnett Hathaway. You think so? I think he will be a monster. He is such an annoying player to play against. Because he is so good at separating people from the puck, creating havoc, and then being in the exact right position in front of the net to create even more havoc. And scoring goals so it, and he's deceptively good at passing the puck and he's set up eat bread for a number of good chances too so i, I would tell you matt i know you're a hathaway fan and joining while he's here because i don't think he'll be back next year oh i think he's getting a three or four year extension i i don't i don't know if they're gonna want to pay what he's gonna want it he's not gonna cost more than a million and a half i don't know if he's gonna be worth a million and a half but yeah, I think he will. I I wouldn't, you know, anything under two million, frankly, for any high quality depth forward, awesome. You know, if you're a good quality forward, that's fine. Like, so you, think, it, so you think Hathaway will be the big pest this year? Yep. He'll be one of those guys that like will get under the skin of literally every player that he plays against, and. You know, thankfully the Flames have a few of those guys, but, you know, you're expecting Kachuk and Bennett and Neil to be dicks, basically. But I don't think that a lot of teams would expect Hathaway to, just because he doesn't quite have the legacy of reputation that those other three do. But and at the same time, that's his role on the team. Yeah, but he's good at it. And that's a different thing. Like, some players have that role on the team, but they're not really good at it. Hathaway is very, very good at it. And I think that the big pest this round is going to be Bennett, just because I think he will have more matchups against the first line than Hathaway will. Yeah. I think Hathaway will be a bit muted in what he does because he's not going to be out there against really great players. Well, I no, but he'll. I think that his job, Hathaway's job, is not going to be necessarily going after the top guys. It's going to be going after Zadorov and Cole and driving them absolutely batty and getting them to take dumb penalties. And I think that that will be his job is to t get piss those two guys off because they're undisciplined when they're angry and they yeah, do th dumb things. I think that uh, Bennett's going to be the guy who's going to drop the gloves a little bit more. I think he's going to be the big pass for this team, at least in round one. Yeah, I think Hathaway drops the gloves at least once. I think all of Kachuk and Bennett and him and Neil all drop the gloves at least once. Who do you think will be sort of the unlikely, the Marty Jelena, who emerges as the kind of unsung scoring hero for the playoffs? Um, 
I'm not gonna go unsung. I like I I'm expecting Maybe eat the bread. guy didn't turn on in the regular season and doesn't. Well, I'm expecting eat bread to score a few timely goals if the Flames go on a longer run. Andrew Majapani. Yeah, yeah, uh, but I'm expecting Elias Lindholm to be a game breaker for this team. I think Lindholm's going to be a big part of it. For me, sort of the guy I think is going to come out of nowhere and surprise us is going to be Derek Ryan. Yeah, I agree. I think a lot I, of teams... I think he'll be a huge, huge piece. Like, especially if the Flames go far, I he'll be one of the most important players on the team. And I think that, again, matchup-wise, his line's going to probably get a bit better matchup than some of our other lines, and they're going to have to take advantage of that. Yeah. They're going to have shorter shifts on the ice, but they're going to have to make, you know, quick decisions and do good things with that line. Yeah. Well, you got to figure that the fourth line is going to be facing the third, fourth pairing for our third and fourth or third pairing guys, the five, six guys for the, on the fence. So uh, they have enough offensive talent where they can exploit that and create some good scoring chances and generate momentum and playoffs hockey especially is all about momentum. And if you can have a really good fourth line shift, then you're throwing out your first line and like you can kind of hem the other team in for a l extended period of time if they can get that going and perhaps scoring some goals and especially in the second periods if the that fourth line hems in the the other team and you can sub the Gaudreau line against that third pairing you might be able to score a goal or two in a series just based off of that kind of a thing so Hopefully, I I would not be surprised if the fourth line is one of the most important lines for the Flames. And I wouldn't the, be sure. And the reason I said um, Ryan over the fourth line is, I mean, we saw this coach loves the guy. And when Monaghan was out, we saw Ryan put on that first line. I think you're going to see Ryan play in a lot of different scenarios with a lot of different guys on power plays, PKs. And I think that's going to help him, you know, maybe get some more offensive muscle than just playing with uh, Mangiapane. Yeah, I agree. And he, a lot of fans were a little reticent when we signed him, but boy, is he an important piece of this team. And you just stick him anywhere, and he does a good job. Like, he, you throw him on the first line, he, he scored a couple goals, you know, with Gaudreau out there. So, you know, it, he can literally play up and down the lineup, and that having someone who can do that, especially as a fourth liner, like that's ridiculous and so i think that he'll be one of the most important pieces especially if anybody does go down with injury he can slot up in their spot and not really take too much away another guy who's not in the lineup now but i think will be a key for the flames victory is austin zarnik yeah i wouldn't be shocked if he got a few games in um the next question for you who do you think is gonna have the best and worst uh playoff beards on the team uh Easy one there, Sam Bennett. He will. You think clearly, he has the best beard? Yeah, he he'll be clearly the runaway winner on that. And the worst, it'll either be Matthew Kachuk or Johnny Goudreau. And I think it'll go to Kachuk because it'll just be add that extra layer of greasiness to his persona because he doesn't grow a good beard at all, and so it'll just be even more of a face that you want to punch. So I think that'll add an extra dimension to his game. I think uh, Smitty, Mike Smith, is going to have the best playoff beard. I think we're going to – it might even get so long we might see it below the mask. Yeah. Um, and then I think probably – I mean, you got to look at the guys that are old enough to grow beards. Probably Giordano is the next guy. Yeah. Um, well, well Bennett's think, already grown quite a good one, so – Yeah, I, ben, Bennett, I, th I don't know how much beard he's going to do versus mustache. We'll see. Yeah. Like, that's been his thing this year. I think for me – the most pathetic looking one's probably going to be Elias Lindholm. Yeah, he's not. He hasn't done bad in the past. Um, or Mangiapane. Well, he's Italian. He should be able to grow a beard. <laughs> we'll see. He's he's always been uh, clean shaven. I was looking back at pictures in junior, and he hasn't grown much either. Yeah. So I'll say that I think the best beards are going to be uh, Hamonic, Smitty, and Geo. Yeah. And the worst beard will be Mangiapane, Lindholm, and Goudreau. Yeah. Um, it, it, and, you know, it'll be interesting to see some of these guys. Like, it'll be interesting to see Raz with a big beard. 
Yeah. Or shelling well, into the big beard. Yeah. The player I'm most looking forward to overall, though, uh, in this playoffs is Matthew Kachuk. Just because yeah. you know that he is just going to annoy the hell out of everybody. And if you look in the past... Teams You've already that, got to pay the man. He might as well go out there and be amazing. Yeah. Well, you look at the teams in the past that have been successful... They all seem to have someone that kind of fits that character and who just gets under everybody's skin. And I think that he will be one of the keys to the flame success this spring. Like, if he can hit you both in terms of physically, but also on the score sheet, like, he. Honestly, I would not entirely be shocked if he won the Conn Smythe if the Flames were to go that far. I don't know. I think if you're gonna if you're gonna give the Conn Smythe if they go that far, you got to give it to whoever they ride in net. Yeah. Like I know what you're saying, but with we with goaltending being one of the weaknesses, if we can ride one of our goalies, I think he's got to get it. Yeah. It also depends on if the goalie, like if one plays like almost every game well that's what i mean if we ride one you give it to him yeah true um we had a fan question this this week from uh rain underscore couture on twitter at rain couture um i'm optimistic about our chances this year but here's my reservation slash question i want to see answered by the team are we tough enough to make a deep run to the point we'll be able to to the point to that point will teams be able to slow down number 13 with physicality I hope Benny had enough time to get healthy. So let's break this down one piece at a time. Are we tough enough to make a deep run? M- my first question is to find deep. You and I talked earlier. I think it's very possible this team gets to the third round. I think we'll definitely see a second round uh, playoff matchup for these guys. Yeah. Um, I honestly don't see a problem. Like We have enough physical guys uh four forwards that I'd consider to be quite physical and others that don't mind elevating that aspect of their game. I don't really see that being too much of a problem. Like San Jose has some finesse guys on their team. Uh, Vegas has some finesse guys on their team. Like it, it's yet they also have the warrior types as well. So like it's, I don't see that like, Say, like, San Jose, they have a Vander Kane. Okay, yeah, we have Kachuk, Neil, Bennett, and Hathaway. Like, that that's fine. Like, you know, they have one, we have a few. Like, I don't see that being that big of a deal. And, like, most of our guys aren't small. And, like, we do have a couple of smaller players, but every team does now like it's not Do you have a worry that with how healthy we were this year that we're gonna have a bunch of injuries stack up in the playoffs could happen it, literally anything can happen and that could be the big undoing of these guys yeah and that was the undoing of the 04 team uh mm-hmm. they just ran into too many injuries to too many players and that can be it and you know but you insert any team like if Say the Penguins lost Crosby and Malkin to injury in game one, and they're out for the playoffs. Well, the Penguins are obviously screwed. Like, they're they're not going to go anywhere. And same with Tampa. If Kucherov and Stamkos get hurt, they're no longer a dangerous team to the extent that they were. To the second point here, do you think teams will be able to slow number 13 down with physicality? No. We, I think the question comes from the fact in the past we've seen him get slashed a lot. Um, you know, we saw him kind of hurt his wrist, what was a couple of years ago in the playoffs when he was getting slashed? Yeah, they've cut down on the slashing a lot, and I think that they'll still call that in the playoffs because uh, I don't think that they want to see players getting their wrist broken just because of stupidity. I think when you're at home, you have a, an advantage there because you get to kind of control who Goudreau matches up against. And I think we have enough physical guys that we can throw it back. I think in the past, especially when we've played teams like the Ducks, we kind of got bullied because we didn't have enough physical pieces. Yeah. But I think we've got enough that, hey, you want to go out and do something to you know, Goudreau? It's going to be tit for tat. And I think knowing that there's guys you can throw it on either side, I think it keeps the game a little, little more honest. 
Yeah, exactly. Like, if, say, someone goes after Goudreau, well, you can just sit and Rantanen is playing, you can just send somebody to go hit Rantanen, you know, instead, or, you know, and target where he was hurt. You know, it that's the way that it goes. And so if you don't hit my guy, I won't hit yours, and we're good. I also see Goudreau getting a little bit smarter when it comes to just kind of being aware of who's around him. Like, in the past, it seemed like he was so focused and he was going towards the net on just the net. He didn't often know that there's a guy behind him ready to slash him or there's a guy beside him trying to take him out. And it just seems like his spatial awareness of the ice is better this year. And I think because of that, he's not going to get pushed around as much. Yeah, and he's also picking his spots, I've noticed, a lot more and relying on his line mates to create things where, like, last year and years before that, like, it was basically Gaudreau had to drive everything because, you know, his line mates weren't very good. And, um, like, now having Lindholm, who's a very credible first-line player who can create a play all on his own, that allows Gaudreau to be able to just kind of float around into open space and where he's not going to get slashed because he doesn't have the puck and be ready for a quick shot or whatever. Yeah, and, and I think being that that line has... I think in the past it was if you shut down Goudreau, you shut down the flames. And I think the fact that, hey, if if someone's coming on Goudreau to slash him, he'll he has no problem, as we've seen, moving that puck to somebody else. And I think it's going to be, you're not going to be able to just target number 13 to take us out. No, and like last year, like it was basically, you can ignore Michael Furland and just focus all your energies on Mad- on Monaghan and Gaudreau. Because if you stop those guys, like Furland's not going to do a damn thing by himself. So like he can have the puck all day and you don't have to worry, you just have to worry about the other two guys. And now the Flames have a full line where all three are good. And there's no one part that you can specifically target because they can all hit you really good. Yeah, I mean, I I can see it being a bit of an issue maybe in the first game or two as you start to learn their tendencies. I don't think it's going to take number 13 out, but I can see the Flames sort of having to adjust to who to play him against, uh, when to get him off the ice, that sort of thing. So you might see it as as an issue in game one. That's about it. Yeah. And adjustments will be made on the fly. Like, I don't even see it lasting more than a period, frankly. Me neither. And and you were right about what you started this question with, which is the league's really trying to cut down on that. Yeah. And And last time it was an issue, they put an extra pad in his glove, too. I think he'll start the playoffs with sort of modified gloves. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked with that either. Um, Bennett uh, should have had enough time to get healthy, so and like there was no need to put him in harm's way. You, those games don't matter, so just let him be. And and even if not, I feel pretty confident starting Zarnik in this spot in the lineup. Exactly. If like, he needs a, a game or two still to sit, but Peters tells us he's healthy. I don't think he would say that if he wasn't ready to go. And again, as you and I have talked about, they have enough depth that if he's not ready, you wouldn't put him in. I mean, he's a third-line guy. If he's not ready, you sit him for a little bit. It's not like he's imperative to our playoff success. Yeah. Like, if the the flame season comes down to how good Sam Bennett is, like, that, yeah, some things are going a little weird. <laughs> so, you know, I want to see him in the lineup, and I think he'll be that big physical presence. But we've also seen James Neal being a little more physical lately. So I think if Bennett has to sit out for a game or two still, um, I think Neil can sort of step in there and, um, you know, I don't want to say replace him, but sort of play that that style of game that we might be missing. Um, and I, like I said, I'm okay with that lineup either way. But yeah. I have I have no doubt Bennett was on the ice today. I have no doubt that he's ready to go. Yep. Um, you know, I mean, we saw Sh- Sh- Sean Monahan sit out a few games too. He's ready to go. So, like Matt said, why play him? There was no point. Don't want anybody to get hurt when the games don't matter. So for Flames fans that are uh, that are looking for a place to watch the game, if you're going to the Dome and you got tickets, fantastic. That's the place to be. 
If not, the Flames are doing something interesting. They're holding what they're calling the Red Lot. It's going to be a viewing party. It's free, and it's in Lot 3, which is the parking lot just off Olympic Way outside the Dome. They're going to have a huge screen out there. Like, I think it's, I was reading, a 105-inch screen. So you can still go to the Dome, even if you don't have tickets, and... Uh, watch the game, hang out with Flames fans. It's almost like the tailgating environment that we've seen in the past couple of years. So if you're looking for a great place to go, put your red jersey on and head to the Dome. Yep. Even if you don't have a ticket. Matt, you're not allowed to wear your black jersey for this run. It's the Sea of Red. No horse head jersey for you. I don't even own a horse head jersey. so No Heritage Classic jersey for you either. That's maroon. Darn. Darn. Sea of Red, my friend. Sea of Red. I'll even let you wear an Atlanta away jersey, but not that maroon jersey. Yeah. So if you don't have a Flames jersey, wear just a red T-shirt or go to Walmart and pick up a $12. Remember in 04, those like T-shirt jersey things? There's a T-shirt with the guy's name on the back. Pick one of those up for 12 bucks. but get yourself something. Get your, you know, your partner something. Get your parents something. We need this city to be red, not just at the dome, but all over on game days. Or you could be like that one doorknob who wore the neon yellow highlighter t-shirt that one playoff it looked like he was glowing i remember seeing like the yellow all around him and it looked like he was glowing (laughs) (laughs) like he was radioactive or something yeah so yeah if you're going to the dome or anywhere near the dome or even if you're going to be in calgary during those uh those days it's okay to wear your flames jersey to work if your boss complains tell him to come talk to us um wear red find something red a red tie a red dress shirt Wear red. Like, we, we want this this city to be red on game days. Yep. And you don't need to go buy an expensive Flames jersey. So, I know uh, one of my friends already is buying flame shirts in bulk. So, he's, like, got them to hand out to people. I said, you're just going to, like, issue them red? I can see him on the train being like, you're not red. Here. You look like a medium. So, I don't know what he plans to do with them. But, yeah, let's let's get this city nice and red on, uh, on game days. And if you are partying on the Red Mile... Um, we asked Calgary Transit today how late the trains would be open because of the late games. And Calgary Transit confirmed for us that um, trains are going to be not any later than usual, but they're already late. Uh, the last northbound train from downtown is around 1247 and southbound at 155 a.m. So be responsible. It's, it's, always fun to, uh, it's always fun to party, but we want everyone to have fun, be responsible, and, and let's not have any injuries or get anyone hurt. Yeah, and hopefully the uh, it, if there are any overtime games that they make some modifications to that, because like if a game like an eight o'clock game goes into like triple overtime, like that game's not ending until like two a.m. <laughs> the sun's gonna come up by the time that game's over. Yep. Though at the same time, in round one, I'm not too worried about triple overtime against Colorado. You never know. Could happen. Um, so just be responsible, be ready. Um, if you need it, you can get, if you, I'm sure if you look around or if you tweet to us, uh, we can give you an Uber code for your first ride for free. So if you uh, need something and you, you know, don't want to pay the cash, get home safely and, you know, find some way to do that, whether you get a free Uber ride or take the trains or whatever that is. But it's fun to be in the playoffs, but we got to be safe. We got to be responsible. So everyone, uh, we want everyone here to to be on the parade route. We don't want to lose any Flames fans. No. So Matt, let's uh, let's look ahead. I guess our prediction game changes now. It's not, we're predicting one one team playing one other team. So we will do uh, the first and second games, the two home games, and then you and I will record again before Game Three in Colorado. So we got two games of the Dome. How do you think these ones turn out? Win win. You think so? Yep. It should be. Like, frankly, the Flames are the best. They need to come out and show it. And any less, like, a split is a failure. And, like, they need to show that we are the real deal. And that, you know, like, the past, the Flames have always underperformed in the playoffs, except for 04. Like, since 89, the Flames have been a persistent failure when it came to the playoffs. Like, the lot. my mother. Well. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but, it, you know, in, like, the last playoff run, it, like, it, the Flames should have beat Anaheim in that series, and yet they got swept because they looked past the team a bit, and Elliot was horrible. And, 
they need to show that this team is different and that we are able to rise above just like earlier in this season like last year after the break the team just completely faded away and disappeared and never recovered this year the first line struggled but the team basically played all right the rest of the way and were able to maintain and win the the conference and they need to dispel that whole legacy of failure and just we're better than Colorado go kick their ass I think the Flames also will win the first two I don't think they're necessarily gonna win like 5-1 I think especially the first game there may be some struggles I could see Colorado getting up on the scoreboard at some point before we overtake them Um, but I think it's I don't know if you remember in 80s wrestling when the guys would go to the middle of the ring and they put their hands interlocked and see kind of the test of strength. Yeah. I think that's sort of what game one's going to be. It's going to be sort of, okay, let's throw everything we got and see how both teams adjust to it. And I could see them having some troubles in the first game, especially early. Um, but I think Calgary will win both. Yeah. So. What are your thoughts we... on the whole series before we get going? <sighs> I think it's going to be a six-game series. Five for me. Five? Which one do you do? You, when do you think they lose, or do you not want to go uh, that ga- far? Game three, I think they'll lose. And first, first one back in Colorado. Yeah, and then close them out. I could see that. I'm I'm saying a six-game series. That if they close out in five, I'm going to be really excited. Yeah. Um, I think if it goes to seven, it means Calgary has taken their feet off the gas. Yeah. They have structural issues if it goes seven, or, or goaltending's not working, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, there's um, some structural foundational issue if they either lose or it goes to seven. Yeah, well, if they lose, I think there's a lot more issues there. I think seven. I still think you can win it in seven, but I think it means they either underestimated Colorado or they've taken their foot off the gas somewhere. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think you got to close out in five or six. I don't think it's happening in four. No. I How would you say? I think that four is more likely than seven or a, an outright loss. Yeah, I I don't know. I almost feel like if they do it in four, you're putting – you're going to get the fan base too excited, especially moving into a, what I think will be a difficult second-round matchup with whoever they're taking on. Yeah. Honestly, I think that the West – it will be decided in the second round of our series with whoever San Jose or Vegas. I think whoever wins that wins the West. I think for the average fan, if Calgary goes five or six, that seems like, you know, a well fought playoff series. If Calgary sweeps and then say loses in the second round, I think they built up all this anticipation for the average flames fan that it's going to seem like a bigger letdown. Yeah, I agree. So So, then they just have to win, and then who cares, you know? (laughs) Well, no, for sure. But, I mean, you know, and and there's this there's this sentiment, too, that we didn't discuss this week, but that idea that you have to have playoff heartbreak before you can have playoff success. Yeah. And you hear a lot of guys talking about that. I don't know if I necessarily buy it, but I just – I don't think this Calgary's year. I think they're going to do it, you know, in the next handful, but I don't think tonight – this is their year. I'm hopeful – but, uh, you know, like anything, it just depends on who we face. Like, it, if the Flames, say they make it to the finals and they play Tampa, I don't see any realistic way where we win. Um, unless Tampa's, like, massacred and they just got there by the skin of their teeth and are battered to beyond recognition. Um, if, say, like a team like Toronto makes it to the finals, I think the Flames win. But it just depends on... The match. I think the East has gone horribly wrong if Toronto makes it all the way. Yeah, it, it, something bizarre has happened, like Columbus, uh, Carolina, and <laughs> several other upsets happen. Plus, if Toronto makes it all the way, you know that nobody in this country is going to be talking about the Flames. Exactly, underdogs all the way. I, you know, it would. Yeah, it's pretty much going to be. You know, oh, and there's this other Canadian team. Uh, yeah, some red guys. Anyway, back to the Leafs. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it would be kind of funny just from a media perspective. But 
Um, to close out the show this week, we're going to do something different. We're always looking for the, the playoff anthem every year. And we, we all remember In the Dome and a few other ones. Uh, we were sent this song this week to play, and it's by a group that's calling themselves the Nosebleeds, and it's called This Is Our Year. And we'll tack that on at the end of the show right now. And we also have the YouTube video um, on the show notes. If you want to see the YouTube video for it, you can do that there. It's a collaboration of a whole bunch of uh, guys in Calgary, but kind of a catchy song. So this is the Nosebleeds, This Is Our Year. Matt? Enjoy the first two games, and we will talk to you on Monday. As always, go Flames, go. And everybody better be chanting that before the anthems. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.